program is brought to you by ExtraTech, a leading professional IT training institute and 3Beats Education and Visa Services, a leading Australian education consultancy. Namaste and welcome to yet another episode of the Influence Academy with myself, Anusha. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I'm accompanied by a very special guest. He is Mr. Kevin McCormack. Kevin has spent 20 years of his life providing teacher training workshop in schools worldwide. He is a frequent visitor to Nepal, where he has built three schools, a library, and currently runs two Montessori centers in the country. He has inspired millions through his TED Talk. As an educator, he's been appointed as LinkedIn Global Goodwill Ambassador for his work in education for disadvantaged. He is able to grab several prestigious accolades in his name, among which he was nominated as an Australian of the Year for his work in education inequality. Gavin preaches for an education that focuses on students' individuality rather than thinking of them as an empty bucket ready to be filled up by education. He emphasizes, he emphasizes his methodologies in education that actually make students ready for life. A quick mention to our sponsors, Extra Tech, and premier IT job ready training institute in Australia, and 3 Bs Education and Via Services, a leading Australian education consultancy. So without further ado, it is such an honor to have you in our studio, Gavin. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for those uh, kind words. It's always awkward listening to those things when you're <laughs> reading them out. I think, oh God, is that really true? Is that me? It is you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it is exhilarating to meet someone who likes to visit and spend so much time in Nepal. Mm. You must have an excellent understanding of Nepalese people and their culture. And we're very curious to know your experience regarding your first visit in Nepal and what were the objectives of your visit? So that's an interesting uh, question. Um, so I was, uh, I've been a teacher 20 years, as you said, mm -hmm. and about uh, six or seven years ago, I decided to become a Montessori teacher. Now that involves retraining a new degree. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that the Montessori approach to education was something I wanted to be involved in. And so kind of three years into that degree, you do prac teaching placements. You go to schools and you, I approached my, my boss and I said, look, you know, I've got my final prac coming up um, and I'd like to do it in, in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. And ordinarily you just do them around Sydney. So you'd go to, you know, Strathfield or you'd go to Baron Joey. And I, and I went to him and said, I'd like to go to the Himalayas and do my final prac there. And he said, it's a bit out there. Uh, but uh, give me some more details. But I didn't have any details, so I quickly went online and I found a, um, a Montessori school in Kathmandu. And I gave them a call and the, the man was very uh, very approving. He said, come, yes, you can do your prac here. I did all the paperwork, no problem. And I thought, what I'll do, I'll take lots of things with me to donate mm -hmm. while I'm there. Because I, I, you know, I know about Nepal, but I'd never been there. And I flew from here to Bangkok so I could change flights. You know, the big flight that goes from Thailand mm -hmm. to, to Kathmandu every day. And when I landed in the airport, there was a message from him in my inbox saying, I'm so sorry, I have the dates wrong. We're actually closed for two months, you can't come. And I thought, oh God, I, I've taken, I've taken um, two months off work to come and do this. And he's just telling me you can't come anymore and I'm already in Bangkok. So I just quickly opened Google Maps and went to the second Montessori school and clicked it and called him from the airport. And, he was a wonderful man who's now a dear friend, like a brother to me. His name is Anand Devkota, and if he's watching, then hello, Anand. Um, and I called him, and he was running a Montessori training center. So I called him and said, look, you know, this is the situation. Uh, can I come? And he said, brother, I'll be at the airport waiting for you. So I landed uh, at Kathmandu, and there he was, this man, and he took me to his training center. Now, I wasn't supposed to go into a training center. I was supposed to go into a school. Mm -hmm. So I thought, look, oh God, I don't know how this is going to work. We went there and uh, he was running a training center. He had about 50 or 60 uh, women enrolled. And um, so I went back to my, my, uh, my um, university and said, look, I'm at a training center. Can I do my prac here? He said, no problem. That's totally fine. You can still do it there. It's, it's, it's easy. And then I realized that the training center he was running wasn't great. Mm -hmm. He was lacking materials. There was no curriculum. It wasn't looking good. Although I had a lot of enrollments. So I stayed there for six weeks and I just took the training for, for six weeks of all these ladies from, from the mountains. Mm -hmm. They were beautiful. And, uh, and you know, we, we became really close friends, me and him. And then I told him I'm going to, um, I'm going to revolutionize this training center for him. I'm going to fix it up. So I came back here, 
to Australia. I got everything I could possibly get. I went back and I kitted out the whole place. I trained his trainers, gave him a new pedagogy, gave him a new curriculum, mm -hmm. said, this is how you're going to run the centre from now on. And the centre um, is just kicking goals all the time. But interestingly, I don't want to talk too much, but interestingly, mm -hmm. interestingly on that trip, he told me, can you come to my village? It's in Noor Parasi. Mm -hmm. So we went to his village and I met a lady in a school. And well, I say a school, it was like a, a garage, dusty garage. She had 20 or 30 children in there and there was nothing. She had a pen and a piece of paper and the kids were sitting on the floor and there was zero. And I said, what is this? And she said, this is a school. I said, this is, this is not a school. And she said, I've written to the government for 16 years, but I, I haven't had any help yet. I said, in six weeks, I'll be back here. I'm going to fix this place up too. So I came back to my community in Balmain and I showed them some pictures of this lady. Her name was Padma. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, we've got to help this lady. This is a school. And in Balmain, you know, in Sydney, there's plenty of money. And people said, oh my God, that's a school. And the whole community in Balmain started to, to donate money and packages and the kids were making worksheets and I put them all in a, in suitcases and I flew them all to Nepal six weeks later, mm -hmm. went to her school and then I, I fixed it completely. That is so amazing of you, Kevin. And I wish there were more people like you who would go an extra mile to help people on the other side of the world. And true, Nepal can be an adrenaline adventure, yep. a cultural eye-opener and an experience of a lifetime mm. for anybody. There's no question yeah. about that. Okay, so let's take a tangent toward your personal life. So you, you were born in England, yep. you came to Australia with your parents, right? So how was your childhood like and what did your young self want to be in future? So I didn't, I didn't come here with my parents actually. Okay. Okay. I, I, was, I lived in England <clears throat> until I was um, 24 and uh, I wanted to be a football player. Mm -hmm. So I, I used to play football in my, for my local town and I actually moved to France mm -hmm. to play football in France when I was 23. And uh, it was an au pair there, an au pair looking after a little baby boy and a little baby girl all day, but playing football in the local village and I wanted to be a football player. And I was destined to be a football player. You know, I was good and I was playing for a good team and I was going in the right direction. But then I, I broke my ankle and um, that was it. It was finished. I, I couldn't play anymore. For two years I couldn't play and so I lost my contract and then I scrapped playing football. Mm -hmm. And I was qualified as a teacher. So I was like, that's it. The decision is made. I'm now going How to be a teacher. How old were you back then? Twenty. I was 23 then. 23. Yeah, I was living in France, playing football. There. I went home to my home village, and I played for another friend's team. He said, "Please play for us at the weekend." I said, "Look, I'm under contract with this club. I really can't." And I said, "Okay, I will." And then I broke my ankle, mm -hmm. and so it was over then. And then I said, "That's it. Teaching's my thing." And I always loved teaching. You know, I loved working with children, and, and you got a chance to feel like you're making a difference and making a change. So, do you uh, do you do play football as a hobby nowadays? Yeah, I still play football here in Sydney, and I have, you know, since then. But it was I wanted it to be my profession. Okay. But actually, what I found was teaching became a profession where you can travel the entire world. Mm. So I lived in France. I moved to Spain. I then travelled the whole world. I worked in China. Worked in South Korea. And then I ended up coming to Australia, where I worked in an Islamic school here mm. for 10 years in Lakemba. Mm. And that was wonderful. And I learned how to speak Arabic there. And I worked with children from Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq. And, and that was really wonderful to, to do that. Um, and then, you know, I, I realized that there's so many people. If, if you really believe in what you want to do and you understand it, you you don't you're not selling a product it's not like selling a fridge to someone who doesn't need a fridge mm -hmm. you're just saying i think this is the way that teaching should go i think this is what education should look like mm -hmm. and then if people start to think that what you're saying is true or they believe it they come along on the journey with you yeah. and so i found that going to nepal ended up being yes it was culturally wonderful and you know i love the people they're so kind but i realized that I'm a teacher and I have a class and I can make a difference with 30 kids. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a school principal, so I have 300 kids. And he's like, well, it's even a bigger difference. Still, it's not big enough. Then you go to Nepal and you're like, if I can open a training center in Nepal and I can change the way that the teachers are being trained, they come in, they're trained and they leave, they go back to their school and they go, I'm not going to teach the same way that I was taught. I'm going to mm -hmm. change that. Um, then the difference that you're making then starts to get exponentially so huge and you realize there's a real change happening here and I'm part of it. I can I have the power to do that. It is it, remarkable. Sometimes um, I go to bed at night, you're lying mm. in bed and you just before you close your eyes, you think, I wonder all the things that you've done mm -hmm. and all the experiences you've had, 
you know, it's causing this kind of wave of change all over the place. And you, you understand, like, you'll know, you mm -hmm. post something online, like this TV show, people watch it and it changes their life. They can take a new pathway because of that. So we all have a responsibility mm -hmm. to be the best person we can be, to be positive and to try to influence people in a good way. And I think that that's what we should all be doing, really. Yeah, but many people would not want to take teaching as a profession. And you've been so passionately involved in this teaching yeah. and pedagogy. And the term pedagogy is really intriguing, like what can a teacher do to influence learning in others, right? Mm. So when did you realize that this was a profession for you and especially Montessori training in particular? Well, the profession, I sat with my mum the night before. Mm -hmm. We were sitting in the house and we had to choose a university to go to. Mm -hmm. And you have a booklet in England and you just pick your courses you're interested in. You submit six applications and you get chosen to, to do one or all. And I said to my mum, I think I want to be an economist because I was studying economy. And she said, I said, you can make a lot of money if you're an economist because you know how to play the market. Mm. We can become very rich. My, my family's very poor. My mum was a single, my mum was a single mum when she had me. My dad left before I was born. Mm -hmm. So it was just me and my mum. I live with my granddad and we we're just talking last night with some friends about we're sitting around last night talking about our, what our dinners looked like as children. Mm -hmm. And everyone was, you know, talking of my dinner as a child. And my mum will agree with this is we had four, there was, I've got two brothers. So we had three bowls of soup and my mum used to put five loaves of bread on the table and say, fill yourselves up. So we just dip bread in the soup and fill up so we felt full because so we didn't have any money. So I wanted to be rich so I could make my mum proud, but I thought that was the answer to, to life. Mm -hmm. If I've got money, I'll be happy, you'll be happy, you'll be proud. My mum turned to me when I said I'd be an economist and she said, don't, that's not going to make you happy. You should be a teacher. Children love you. Children just sort of come to you, well, and it's true for some reason, they all just come to me all the time. Um, she'd be a teacher, and I said, why? And she said, because you'll never work for the man, not the man, but mm -hmm. you'll never work for, for the dollar. Mm -hmm. You'll always work for the community. Mm -hmm. And every single day, you'll have a feeling that you've made a difference in someone else's life. And she was right. She was completely right. That's mm -hmm. exactly how it feels, because the children go home, mm -hmm. and you feel, I made a difference today. So what do we mean by pedagogical treatment? Okay, yeah, well that's interesting because we, you went to a school similar to yeah. myself in terms of not the, how it looked, but how you were taught. Yep. And many schools around the world still follow this model now, which is the teacher stands at the front, all the kids sitting down listening, and they're all quiet, you were quiet too. Mm -hmm. You probably got threatened with a stick, you know, or whatever, I, you know, I'm not sure. Anyway, the, it's really interesting because the teacher has to have control yep. and says, I'm in control of this class, and if you're quiet and I'm in charge, then that's a successful room. And everything that you need to know is in my brain, and I'm going to just distribute it. Mm -hmm. If you can absorb it, then um, that's great. I think the teacher must uh, trust that their child, or sorry, that their student can handle the pedagogical treatment based around independence, choice, and experimentation. That is 100% right. correct. Because every child is different. They have their own pace. Yes. And I also found like an interesting quote in your article that it's not what children are being taught that they causes their eyes to glaze over. It's how they've been taught. Yeah. And it's all about trust. And that's it. Uh, that's exactly it. Yes, you obviously read my article, which is lovely. Yes, Thank yes. you for reading that. But it is about that, of course. Mm -hmm. It's not about being in control. Mm -hmm. It's actually about giving children an opportunity to try to explore. Yeah. And, you know, you're very lucky in Nepal because you have this wonderful natural environment that's, that's under, underutilized when it comes to education. We shuffle the children into the classroom, into this box, mm -hmm. four walls, and we say, teaching happens in here, this is where you learn. When you leave, then no learning happens. Actually, all the learning happens out there, <laughs> not in the room. And so, you know, using the natural environment as a, as a catalyst for, for, for change and for learning is, is the best thing you can possibly do. So, yeah, there is, a, there is a change and there is a chance to make a difference, but uh, what needs to happen, and this is why the training centers in Nepal, and we've got one in Bagbazar and one in Butl yeah. in the south, yeah. And we chose strategically opposite ends of the country, mm -hmm. and Butl's a very busy, happening place. Um, the reason we put them there is exactly that reason, so that teachers will leave and say, you know what, it's not about me being in control of you. It's not about you all being silent and listening to me. It's about me inspiring you and then saying, now, what would you like to know about this subject as I started to teach? And the children put their hands up and say, actually, I'd like to know this. That's wonderful. How are you going to find that out? Mm. And the children say, I'm not sure. Well, why don't you talk about that in your group about how you could possibly find that out? I'll help you 
to, you know, I, I always use this analogy that the teacher should really be the bridge between the child and the knowledge, not the distributor. Yeah. To yeah. say, what do you want to know? I will help you get to where the knowledge is, but I won't tell you. And the children all go there to find the knowledge and then come back and feed back to the, to the rest of us. This is what we learned. This is how we learned it. But this is not what we're learning from our, let's say, ancestors or from our leaders, right? We don't know how to practice these kind of techniques that you've shared in Nepal, to be honest. Like, we're not practicing this. We have certain curriculum. We have certain certain courses that we have to complete, mm. you know, so that it could literally fill them up with education. Okay, this is done. I'm done. Yeah. They don't really care about, like, if he's learning or not. He just need to pass. He yeah. just need to have this particular grade. But it does not it does not make him ready for life like you've shared. Exactly. How right. do we do that? Well, if you think about it, actually, let's take you, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you went to a Nepalese school yep. where that wasn't the emphasis. It wasn't about individuality or independence or any of those things. But look at you. You've come to Sydney and you're running a TV show, right? <laughs> On your own. And you've thought outside the box, right? You've thought, how can I use the skills I've got to be entrepreneurial? And this has been created. And actually, that's what always amazes me about Nepal is that Although the, the education is very standardized and, you know, I've seen the textbooks that every, it's, every school has a textbook with at the bank. Yeah. Today we're all learning about the bank and every school's doing the same thing on the same day. But then you go out into the communities and the villages and you see that people are entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. People are opening businesses, they're opening enterprises, they're, they're trying very, very hard. And I can't help but think that... If Nepal didn't have so many hurdles in terms of imports, exports, government legislation, all of this kind of stuff that, that, that causes problems, you know, and it's not all organizational, some of it is geographical. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have roads, mm -hmm. you have earthquakes, you have landslides, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's difficult to get around. You try to leave Kathmandu and get down to Chitwan, it'd take you 10 hours or 30 hours, mm -hmm. you never know. Um, but still, amongst all of that, the Nepalese people managed to have this entrepreneurial spirit like yourself. And Thank you. It, it's amazing. It really is amazing. Like my friend Anand Devkota, yeah. you know, he opened the training center. Mm -hmm. I said, why, why did you open this? He said, because this is a, a gap in the market. There's no one training teachers here. So I decided to make this. Uh, and I, I, I've got to take my hat off to that. And that's why I've been attracted to Nepal so much, because I think that if I am now, you said three schools, we've built 10 schools in total now. Is Anand in Nepal? Anand is in Nepal, yeah. yeah. We've built 10 schools now in total. Mm -hmm. And my thought process behind that is that the children who go to those schools with a new pedagogy, not a new curriculum, but a new way of teaching, mm -hmm. hopefully when they graduate and leave, they'll have the knowledge that you got and I got from school, but also they will have one more stepping stone to becoming more independent and entrepreneurial. And therefore, the economic stability of Nepal can come because entrepreneurial spirit will grow from a very early age. That's my hope. That's my hope. That's our hope too. But That's it takes a long too. time yep. to see that change. I mean, I'll probably be dead before it happens. But you know, it's you hope that you're putting some of those mechanisms in place so you can see that change later down the track. That is so true. Yeah. Okay. Since you've been conducting teacher training workshop all around the world, and I would not want to waste this opportunity to ask and get your opinion regarding Montessori centers, like a good. Montessori centers is a profound concept of childhood development, right? Yes. It's, a, it's a analysis of everything that it takes to help a child. Mm. And there are so many centers operating nowadays and every parent would like to send their child to the best ones. Yes. So how do we choose the best ones? And what are the things the parents should keep in mind before picking Montessori centers or before sending the children? Well, Montessori is uh, interesting because she created Montessori, Marie Montessori. Marie Montessori. Yeah. yeah. She was a doctor. She graduated from uh, an Italian university. In fact, she was the first female graduate ever. She was friends with Gandhi. Uh, you know, she'd done amazing things. Um, and she uh, was all about observing children. That was her whole process was like, I'm just going to watch these children. I'm not going to intervene. It's called uninterrupted work cycle. You leave them be. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see how they learn on their own with no assistance whatsoever. Um, that's very abstract to, to do that because ordinarily we like to be instructors. We like to be directing the learning. I call it being a silent puppeteer. You're kind of like puppeteering the children. They don't know it, but you're saying, why don't we do this now? Have you thought about looking at that? Um, 
so choosing Montessori is interesting because you um, it's not for every child, it's not for every family. Mm -hmm. Some children actually don't want to be left on their own to work. They want to have some direct instructions, they, they thrive in that. So parents have to be sure that they're choosing Montessori for the right reason um, and that they know their child and how their child learns. Also, it's very important before actually joining a Montessori school or starting the process to have some trials to say, is it okay if my son comes for a few days? We don't enroll, we don't pay. We just come for a few days and try it out. And then sit with the child and say, how did you, did you like it? Because mm -hmm. sometimes we think they're going to love it, but they don't. Mm -hmm. Did you like it? And they say, actually, no, I hated it. <laughs> I want to go to my old school or, uh, you know, I like it when there's a teacher standing at the front. Um, and so they will tell you immediately. So when we do that at my school and, we, and, and lots of schools do that. But I think what makes a good Montessori center? It's a very big question. Yeah. I think the basics are that you're the teachers who are working there have to have training mm -hmm. or they have to be in training. Mm -hmm. Also that there is um, an understanding that the community plays an important role in the running of the school too. So it's not the school is just an entity on its own, that the wider community also is the school. There's no question that has to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, the parents, you know, have to be involved in the learning too. I think the, the, um, the ratio of time at school per month is 140 hours mm -hmm. for a child in school mm -hmm. and 540 at home per month. Mm -hmm. That's a, little, a lot of time at home, mm -hmm. which means choosing a Montessori school, parents have to be involved in the education, parents have to understand it, and also parents have to understand that they're also a teacher while they're at home. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something different at home than what the school is saying, for example, you know, in a Montessori setting, we have a situation where if there's conflict if they're in the room, if two children are having an argument, mm -hmm. we won't intervene. And if it gets a bit feisty, we will intervene. But if they're having a debate about friendship, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. I don't like it when you leave me out. Well, I'm not your friend anymore. We leave that. Mm -hmm. And what ordinarily happens is another child will step in and say, hello, you're having an argument here. Mm -hmm. It's really disrupting everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put this mat on the floor called the peace mat. Mm -hmm. You have to sit on it. And you can't leave the peace mat until there's peace. So the children sit on the mat and they talk it through and they can only leave when they've had peace. So when they've talked it out. And in the school you went to and I went to, if we were arguing, the teacher would say, you two, separate. Move over there. You're in trouble now. Mm -hmm. But we don't ever get to learn how to re resolve conflict mm -hmm. because it's just resolved for us. So the reason I use that example is because parents need to be aware of these things too. Because if they're at home and the brother and sister are having an argument, they say, stop arguing, go to your bedrooms. Mm -hmm. We never allow them to resolve it naturally. And therefore so, that's the learning for life. So the center should design, should intend to design, like it should be self-correcting and hands-on, right? Of course. Yep. It should be. There's, uh, there's millions. Yeah. The list is endless. Yeah. But I think the, the, the important aspects are training, mm -hmm. materials. You have to look at the environment. How is the environment? You know, is it set up correctly? Is there order? Is everything in place? Is it neat? Is it tidy? Is the community, am I involved in the learning is the important part. When I go to enroll, does the school say, here's our curriculum, here's what you can do at home, here's how you can be involved, here's when I need you to come in. If you don't have that engagement, if it's a, you give your child to me and you leave, mm -hmm. there's a problem. I mean, it should curately, it's recoverably designed so that every child will discover like on his own, like what are the steps that he needs, to, he or he or she needs to learn in future? Yes. Like it should be cleverly designed in that way. Yeah. Oh, uh, and also, I mean, one of the really big and most important aspects of Montessori education is that the learning is real. Mm -hmm. So when you're learning mathematics or geography or history, you're actually doing something with the knowledge I've just given you that's going to make a difference elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at school at the moment, we have these five 10 year old girls and sorry, four 10 year old girls and um, they are studying uh, economics or finance and, and they're actually doing compound interest as part of the curriculum. And um, they have this knowledge now of how money can make money, right? how interest works. So they came to my office and they said, we have a project we want to do. And I said, tell me more about it. They're only, let me tell you, they're 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of thing that you want, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I so said, tell me about your project. So their idea was, that, Gavin, we want to have a bake sale after school. We want to, make, we want to have some cakes, mm -hmm. a cake stall. 
So we, we all have cake stalls and we see them all the time. But then things get very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, well, tell me more about this cake stall. Why? Why do you want to sell cakes? And ordinarily in, in the past, that children would say, oh, I don't know. We just give the money to the school. Maybe we can buy some books for the library. Okay. But these girls didn't say that. They said, we want to um, raise about $500 and we want to go and buy some backpacks. We found them online. You can buy them for $3 per backpack. Mm -hmm. The children's backpacks. I said, okay, keep talking. And they said, well, if we can raise $500 at the bake sale, we can buy 150 backpacks. I said, great, what are you going to do with the backpacks? I said, we're going to give a backpack to every family in the school to take home with them. Mm -hmm. And they can fill the backpack with things in their house for children that, um, that they don't need anymore. Mm -hmm. Like old teddy bears, clothes, rulers, stationery, paints, pencils, whatever they've got that are secondhand. They can be How recycled. Big the backpack? You know, just a children's backpack oh. about this. Not a big, 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 not the one that you go to Everest with, <laughs> just a normal small one. Um, and we want to give them to families, mm -hmm. fill them up with stuff they don't need, bring them back to school. I said, okay, what are you going to do with the backpacks? He said, well, we've been studying Myanmar in geography. Mm -hmm. This is where learning becomes real. We're going to be studying, we've been studying Myanmar and Geography and they're having a war at the moment. Lots of refugees have left and they've arrived here in Australia. And these refugees, the children are probably very poor and they don't have any materials to go to school with, like a water bottle or a lunchbox. And I said, okay, so we want to donate to those families. So, well, how are you going to find them? He said, we've done the research. There's an organization in uh, Lakemba, which looks after Rohingya Muslims who have come from Myanmar, and we've contacted them. Now we want to contact them and we want to meet the, uh, the uh, CEO. Mm -hmm. I said, goodness me, this is, this, this, was, this is real learning. Like there's so many things in this whole process that are fantastic. In the end, they did exactly what they promised. They had the cake stall, they got the bags, they sent them home, they filled them up. We met the CEO of this organization and they sat with him. We had a meeting, all four of them, they presented to him. And he looked at me and said, are these, these girls are 10. <laughs> I said, they're 10. He said, they don't realize they're going to change 150 families' lives with mm -hmm. what they've just done. And to me, there's no better learning pedagogy than that. That's real. Along the journey is maths, history, geography, you know, everything. But still, they get to use that knowledge to make a difference. And that's what I intended to do in Nepal. I thought, what, what can I do? What a learning for them. Oh, they're just kids. Just kids. I know. They're just kids. And wow. But a lot of power. You know, they, what they have to realize is they are 10, but you have so much power. Because mm -hmm. you see, you know... The, I think children, they look at the news, they see, oh, the rainforests are being destroyed, the koala habitats are being taken away, there's bushfires here, and they feel powerless, like you and I feel powerless. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, have a lot more power than you realize. You just have to start. Mm -hmm. And I think, going back to Nepal, the Nepal schools thing, when I said to Padma, I'll come back and fix this school, mm -hmm. I realized, you know what, I, I can do this over and over again. I have a whole school community here who are willing to donate. And I just need to find a new school every time and I'll go and build another school. And then I realized it's so easy and suddenly it becomes natural. And then you can just continuously do it. Like when you started this TV show and you did your first interview, you're like, oh my God, okay, I need to, I don't know where this is going to. And then now you don't even think about it. Mm. Yeah, you, when you introduce me here, you walk me in, you just like sit down here, put this microphone on, let's go. You just become a master mm. at your craft. And then you can you can do anything then. Like I've mentioned, like you've been operating three um, two Montessori centers in Nepal, and you built a library and three schools, right? So, did you see any gap in Nepal's education system, or if yes, have you and your training centers have been working to close those gaps? Yeah, that's the whole concept. The whole idea was, especially with the training center in Botol mm -hmm. in the south. Um, we saw that there was there was no training center in that whole town. Yeah, so the training center sits just outside um, Traffic Chock, which is just down from the temple. I don't know if you know Butel very well. Mm. Um, and we found an old bank and we, we put the training center in there. And uh, there's a lady running the center called Ambika Mom, and she's a beautiful woman. Um, really understanding and, uh, and she trained with me in Kathmandu first and I said, you, you're not only a teacher, you're a trainer. You need, we need to utilize you in another center. So we took her down to Butl. And we, uh, when I was visiting schools down in Chitwan and Noparasi, I, I realized that the teachers were trying so hard, but they were trying so hard to just to control the class. And I think the big gap was that 
two things that the environment, the Nepalese environment was not in, involved in the learning process mm -hmm. and that a lot of the textbooks, they had things like uh, and things about America and presidents of America and things like this, memorizing, here's a list of the last 15 presidents of America. And I thought, why is that relevant here? That's not relevant here. What's relevant here is, you know, your own community, your own culture, your own history. And I think that that was missing. Um, but also what was missing was that teachers didn't realize that they were able to let go mm. and say, it's okay now, you go and give it a try. But the problem is, obviously, as you know, you're in some of these schools in rural villages and it's just wooden benches on a dusty floor mm -hmm. with a board yeah. and a teacher with a piece of chalk. And that's hard to have a independent learning structure when that's in place. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if I could, I'd go to every single school in the country one by one and I would get all the teachers and I would train them all and I would move to the next school and I would train them all and I would give them all the resources they need and I would paint the entire school. Mm -hmm. um, but it's impossible to ask for one person to do. Yeah. So, I mean, that was my idea was to, especially at Christmas last year, we went down to Nolparasi and there was a school there, a government school, um, and it had 500 children, a big school. But just as I said, dusty rooms, wooden uh, seats, uh, you know the one, it's a wooden seat with a desk here yeah, and you work yeah. on it and a teacher at the front with a board and a piece of chalk. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah. Montessori said that if you can't take the children to the world, which you can't, you bring the world to them. Mm -hmm. So we decided in that school, for example, to fill the gap, like you say, that it's really hard if you're a Nepalese child to understand what's going on in the rest of the world. Yep. Really hard. You know, you've never been to the ocean. I know people who've not been, ever been to the ocean. You know, I met a lady, she was pouring some plastic into this river. There was no water, it was just a pour, putting her garbage in the river. And I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm, I'm just throwing out the garbage. It was in Carvray. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, you know, it's a river. She said, no, no, don't worry. Um, when the rains come, all of this just goes away. And I said, do you know where it goes? And she looked up and she said, uh, no, actually, I don't know where it goes. And I said, I'll tell you where it goes. It goes in the river, it goes to the Ganges, mm -hmm. and then it flows all the way through India. It ends up in Goa or Mumbai, and it goes into the ocean. And then the fish eat the plastic, and we eat the fish, and then we end up eating plastic. And then she said, I've never seen the ocean, and I've never tasted a fish. And she walked off. And I realized the disconnect between, if you are landlocked in Nepal and the Himalayas, the disconnect between my plastic just goes away, where does it go? I have no idea. She's a grown woman, so I, the children definitely have no idea. So the, the big gap there is, is allowing children to see the world and, and what's out there. And if, if they understand how the rest of the world works, maybe they won't make decisions which are incorrect later. When someone offers them something and says, take this offer, they say, hmm, I just need to think about that before I say yes, because I know how the rest of the world works. So, for example, at Christmas when we built this very big school and, and decorated it, we chose a classroom each and we chose a theme. My theme was I did an aquarium, so my whole room was a one big aquarium and I painted this whole room with octopus and turtles and, and sharks and everything that the children would never have seen. Mm -hmm. Another guy, a wonderful guy, Nick Crott, he painted um, Freshwater Beach, mm -hmm. which is on the North Shore. He painted the whole beach scene exactly from a photograph. He's an artist. It was so beautiful in the classroom. You know, this thing was six meters by 10 meters. And, uh, he, and the reason we did that is we wanted to bring the world to these children. So when they go to school, they can see freshwater beach. That's, that's what a beach looks like. That's what Australia looks like. Mine was, you know, I wanted to show them about what the sea life is. And they could have discussions around those things. And that's the big problem with rural um, schools in landlocked countries like Nepal is the disconnect between what you're learning here in this classroom and what's happening in the real world and how you can connect and to it. And also the disconnect between the children and parents. So children are influenced by the parents, right? Of course. So they are learning from them. Like, like you said, the lady, she doesn't know the concept regarding anything mm. and she's trying to teach her child and her child will be expecting that from your teacher. Mm. So that's the teacher's responsibility to, you know, 
or wear him. That's right. Right. So that's a big gap I see. Sometimes that's the problem. And it's like, it comes back to what I said before, that the education of our children is not just about the teacher. Mm -hmm. Like, there's my child, teach him, mm -hmm. fix him, make him smart, give him back to me at 18 years old, yeah. then I can send him off to make money and he'll have a good job. Uh, that doesn't work. It's got to be the parent understands what is the school going to teach my child. I need to teach the same thing. And um, we had a very big conversation about this last night. It's really interesting to talk about this because it, it's not actually what our children hear from us, right, that, that helps them to guide them. What happens is they watch you. They watch you, they yep. Watch, they observe you very carefully, mm -hmm. especially in the formative years, mm -hmm. um, very early on between zero and seven, they watch you. They watch how you're empathetic. Mm -hmm. They watch how you're caring. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, the way that you pick a flower mm. or the way that you stroke an animal or the way that you talk to another person or the way that you, you know, if you see someone crying, the way that you care for that person, they do, they're that. You know, Montessori said something, you know, um, model the behavior you wish to view in your child. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. Be that, you know. Uh, and if you are that, they will become what you want them to be. Like you said, for many years, children have that influence, children have that um, really big influence from their parents, right? They view their whole world from looking at their parents' behavior. Yes. Right. So, and also, like, we can see that many parents are concerned about the children. They want to be, they want them to be perfect. They want them to be ahead of the competition. Yeah. And do you see as a problem? Like, what kind of suggestion would you like to give to the parents so that their children would just not grow up to follow their traits? Yeah. Well, let's put it like this. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a parent who wants your child to be the best. Mm -hmm or the top of the pile, or wealthy, or rich, or whatever success looks like. So in order to make them what you want them to be, you also have to work really hard, work till 10 o'clock at night, to working for a big corporation, making hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to, what you think, provide them. But in that moment when you're actually doing that, you're absent quite a lot. I'm working hard to give my child the best education, but I'm not there, right? But th the child is looking for you to say, where I where's my role model here? Mm -hmm. And you know, mom and dad always have the most power because they are mom and dad. There's this inherent love and bond between child and parent. And so what children need is for the role model to be present, to be right in front of them and to show them how to be. Mm -hmm. It's very important. You know, I, I was talking to a, a mother last night. And she was telling me that her son had a birthday party and there was one boy at school who nobody liked and nobody talked to. And on his birthday party, he invited his friends, but he also invited this boy. She said that she remembers that, it stood out in her mind because she's like, he invited the really lonely child. I often wondered why, she said. And I said, I'll tell you why. I said, you know, you're, you're so empathetic. I said, you care for everyone. And so he's seen that in you and he's done the same thing. He's modeled, you know, you've modeled the behavior you want to see from him and he's copying you, he's mimicking you. And that's what's crucial, you know. Yes. Our children will watch you very carefully and they will just be you. So we have to teach them not to just value themselves as unique and worthwhile, but others as well. So that every person is like their quirks, their personality, their interest or their appearance bring something unique to the world. Yeah, yeah right? of course. It's, it brings something unique and they should, they cannot be duplicated, right? So that is something that we need to teach. Every yeah. parents need to teach their child. And how do they do that? It's, it's really vast. How do they achieve well, that? But it's not about, this is the, the, I think this is the disconnect. It's not about sitting down and saying, little Tommy, let me teach you mm -hmm. about how to be loving and yeah. caring or empathetic or, you know, looking after the environment. Yeah. It's not about that. That's the, the teacher will do that. That's why it's teaching. That's why, that's why they're the, growing up looking at the parents. Like, yeah. they, how do they know what to do in front of them? Yeah, they just think about very carefully. Yeah. Am, I, am I being the role model I need to be? Am I being caring, loving, kind, sustainable? Am I doing... And we'll all make mistakes. We can't be perfect all the time. But they'll watch us like a hawk yeah. and they will do it. And quite often parents and grandparents say, oh, yes, He's just like granddad. Mm. He's probably inherited it. Well, there's no inheriting who you are. The inheritance is granddad was a lovely, kind, empathetic person. So dad was a lovely, kind, empathetic person because he learned it from his father. And then son is a lovely, kind, empathetic person because he, he watched he his dad. He followed the traits, yep. He followed the trait, exactly right. Yep. And so 
I think if we all, and it's not just parents, this is all of us, if we're all positive role models and we all strive to be the best we can be and be as kind and generous as we can be and loving and understanding and empathetic and, and we promote equality and all these things, our children will just be that. You know, Our children need role models that take a chance mm -hmm. and do something that's out there mm -hmm. You know, and they strive for the, for the best. I mean, I, 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 it's not about competing in terms of who's top. It's about who is being themselves. You know, everyone's an individual. Are you all being yourselves? Can you come to school today without a mask on? Then that's fine. Then, then we're all winning here. But if you're having to come in and pretend to be somebody else because that's what you think you need to be, you, well, then we have a problem. Wow. Do that you agree? Is, yeah, I agree. I agree, agree. Um, yeah, I mean, I would like to get your attention to the effect of pandemic now. As you know, how hard it was last year and we're still recovering from it, right? Yes. Uh, as many of us children are also affected from it. They are closing their homes and their education have been severely impacted, right? So do you see any particular problem or any psychological effect that has that you see in the children because of this pandemic? Look, n n I've got to say no, mm -hmm. personally. And I'm not, I haven't traveled, so I haven't been anywhere. You know, it might be a different situation in India. They're having a very hard time mm -hmm. right now or in Nepal. And I've spoken to many of my friends in Nepal who said, you know, it's some people told me it's over now. We're back to normal. I don't know how the situation actually is, but I know that in some of the villages where I have friends, they're just back to school now and things are back to normal. But in my particular school, our children school was closed for several weeks. The children went home. They learned from home. We missed the children a great deal. We realized that the children were the actual school. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the building. Yeah. It wasn't the walls or the roof. It was the children. And we were like, this, we're here at school. We're working. This doesn't feel like a school anymore. Mm -hmm. So when the children came back, obviously, we were very happy with that. But I think Australia's done a very good job at, um, well, a very good job in terms of the pandemic anyway. Mm -hmm. We've been very careful. Yeah. We've worked as a community. Everyone's done the right thing. When we had to wear masks, we wore masks. Mm -hmm. You know, the government made announcements and we followed them. And that was really great. I, 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 we couldn't have been in a better place, in actual fact. Um, but for our children, I, I don't think there has been a psychological problem for them. The reason I asked you this question because I saw one video. So there's a child who is touching every sur surface as if it is a sanitizer. Yeah. You know what I mean? So he's touching walls, he's touching yeah. mailboxes. Yeah. And he's trying I saw to... that too. You saw that too? Yeah, yeah, I did. And that was interesting because it goes back to your point before yeah. about model behavior. Yeah. Quite clearly, the little girl is watching mom and going, right, I need to wash my hands here, I need to sanitize there, <laughs> wash my hands, sanitize here. That's really and they're all just doing it all the time. <laughs> but that's good. I think yeah. that shows you that the mom in question or the dad, he's doing the right well, thing because right the little daughter's going, oh, well, I need to sanitize. And isn't, no, that's great. That's fantastic. But yeah, I think that, you know, if you look at India, for example, I know that those schools have been closed for a year. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, children have been learning from home for an entire year. Mm -hmm. And I guess the problem with that is that a lot of our, you know, a lot of learning takes place through socialization. You know, I always promote a noisy, not noisy, but a nice cacophony of sound in a room mm -hmm. when there's a classroom. There has to be noise because if we're sitting at a table, and we're learning about, I don't know, history of World War II, and we're allowed to talk about it while we're working. You can tell me stuff that I didn't know. I can tell you stuff I didn't know. We can have a debate mm -hmm. while we're working. A silent room, that's, that, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I and mean, you know how big decisions are often made in boardrooms with 15 people all talking. Mm -hmm. That's how we get to a conclusion. That's how we learn from each other. So I think, being at home for an entire year or a really prolonged period of time where it's just you on a laptop could have a psychological effect, for sure. Yeah. I think once things are back to normal and we're all back to school you know, all over the world, uh, we'll start to realize that how, how important that is. What, what, how do the, like, what approach should parents take so that they could create a better environment for the children so that they could recover from this negative impact? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that actually, uh, but what I do know is that uh, it must be very hard for a parent or a family who, dad's working in one room, mum's in the other room, yeah. working online, child's on the other one, um, and everyone's trying to run the show. It's a totally new thing. Oh, it's totally it's new. one of a kind, yeah. Yeah, because what happens with children is, they really interestingly, maybe you have it here at work, I definitely have it at school, is, when they enter the classroom, they walk through the door. It's almost like walking through a false field. You're like, this is where I learned. Mm -hmm. This is where there's rules. Mm -hmm. This is where I have to follow the rules of the school. And when I leave, 
huh, now this is my comfort zone. I'm with mom. I can play and mess around, roll on the floor, make jokes and be silly. I can't do that at school. Suddenly, that, that point of entry is gone. Mm. And what was the living room is now a classroom and an office. That's where I normally roll around and have dinner and have wrestling matches with my brother. Suddenly, it's a place where we learn now. And that's the really hard bit. I think many parents have tried really hard to make that work, yeah. especially if you're living in a very small, I live in a very small apartment. Mine's only 60 square meters, about as big as this office. Mm. I would struggle if I had a child in my house. It would be really hard for me to do that. So I, I don't know what the solution is. And I'm, I guess we're yet to see um, what problems there might be in the future. But I think when the sooner children can go back to school safely, mm -hmm. th the better for me. Get them back to school because they need each other. And yep. also we need them. Yep. There's a lot of benefits to having uh, children in front of you when you're mm -hmm. teaching them. There's no question about just that. Just that the parents are really afraid of being themselves, for example. They're just themselves. They don't know what their children are being exposed to in school. They're like how, what they do talk to with their friends mm. or how they've been, you know, l having that learning process in them. But now they're home. Yep. They don't know how to teach them. There's a, they sort of course book, but they don't know how to guide their children. Uh, yes. Okay. Just study. Okay. There's an hour for you. Yeah. There's an online class. What, what, do you, what, what do we have to do to help yeah. you? You know, that sort of miscommunication, as you say. So, well, the thing is teaching is a profession, yeah. right? So it's like, being a doctor or mm -hmm. being an architect. Mm -hmm. You have a skill mm -hmm. and that skill is teaching. Yeah. And if you're a parent, well, you're not a teacher, right? You haven't done a four year degree in teaching. You don't know about pedagogy or you know how to be a parent. And I think quite often we, we underestimate teachers. We don't put them in the same pocket as a doctor or an architect or a lawyer. Because um, we, we think, Working with children, we can all, anyone can teach children, it's just children. You play in the sand mm. pit or yep. you move some shapes around and add two plus two. Yep. There's more, there's way more to it than that. There's a, more it's, a, it's a skill yeah. that you have to develop and that fine, is... you fine tune it over many, many years. Yep. And the best teachers are ones who, it just comes naturally. You see the room that's running beautiful and everyone's working and independent. You know how to spot when someone's a little bit off. Mm -hmm. A child is struggling a bit. You can see where there's dynamics that are not working. And you can't just do it overnight. You can't click your fingers and mm -hmm. be a teacher. And I think that that's a really important point to make is yeah. that you wouldn't go to the doctor and say to him, are you sure this is the right amount of medication for me? <laughs> or you'll sit in brain surgery and say, are you sure that's the right part of the brain to operate on? And we shouldn't go to teachers and say, do you know how to teach? <laughs> say, of course I do. I've done a degree in teaching. I've been doing this for 20 years. I know how to teach. Um, and I think we have to, some of the most successful countries in the world are ones who put teachers on a high pedestal. They mm -hmm. say teachers, they're like in, you go to Japan, mm -hmm. teachers are the top of the pile. Mm -hmm. They're treated as if I'm handing my children over to these people. They are highly trained, skilled professionals. Let them do their job. So moving on, Gavin, and you are a self published author, Gavin. So you've designed books. There was, and you created that by inspiring by your own childhood bullying experience, right? Yeah. So you designed those, um, you know, designed to educate children to for important things in life. Yeah. And I saw four powerful words in your article that friendship, acceptance, kindness, and inclusion. And those are the most powerful words ever. And I tell you, if world would be a world would be a better place if every individual followed and acted on those words, right? And that is such a remarkable thing to see. And so I would like you to tell us more about the regarded publishing. Um, okay, thank you for that. I, um, I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I told many, my grandfather was a storyteller and I lived with him when I was younger. So I wanted to be a writer and um, people said, you can't just be a writer like that. And actually, as soon as someone told me that, I once told a teacher, I used to work, I said, I'm gonna be a writer, I'm gonna write children's books. He said, you can't, be a, you can't just be a writer. And when she said that, I said, I'll show you, I will be a writer. So I went home and I started writing a book uh, about a penguin. Um, and I thought, you know, this, if this is going to sit in every library in, in the country or go to every classroom in, in, in the world, not that it has, I'm not J.K. Rowling, um, then while children are reading it, I need a really important message in here that's going to help them, to guide them, to model that behavior. So I decided to write seven books, one on each continent. Um, so I've done Australia, I've done Antarctica, uh, I've done Africa, 
Um, I've just finished writing a book based in uh, Europe about a goat, mm -hmm. um, a mountain goat that ends up living in, in Europe. It's really cool. And that's all about um, inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I thought oh, I'm going to write seven books on one on each continent, and uh, I'm up to f number four. Mm. So I've got three more to go. Um, they're lovely. I love them. I don't make much money out of them, actually. I, uh, the margins are so small, and I do the publishing myself. Um, but it's fun. It's really fun. It, what's really, really fun is when you go to the library and your book's in the library. Yeah. Or someone sends you a picture of their child reading your book. And those four powerful words is what every child needs to learn and when they grow up. And that's what's intrigued me. Yeah. That those powerful words and you have them embedded in your book in some way or the other in the stories. Um, the next book is, is the word is equality. Okay. And it's about, I haven't quite got the story down yet, but it's about a crab. Yeah. A, a, a little a, a girl crab and she wants to sail around the world. And um, all of her friends, all these boys, crabs, on the side of the harbour in Canada, they say, you can't sail around the world, you're a girl. And she sails around the world on an old flip-flop, a thong, mm -hmm. with a stick and a pair of underwear attached to it, and the wind catches it and blows around mm -hmm. the world. And she sails around the world and returns back and shows that I can do it. Um, and I haven't written it yet, but I know this, I've got the story. But I think that, you know, th those words are very powerful and important. They are, yeah. But, you know, it's just, like I said before, it's just, you can only do what you can do. For instance, I'm learning those words now. I'm, I'm like, I'm feeling those meanings now. I yeah. didn't know those words when I was a kid. Yeah. If I knew, I would have been something else. That's yeah. what I feel right now. So how it is important to learn those words when, I'm very, when, yeah. when you were a kid. Right. But then, you know, when, you're, when your mom was crying and your dad went over mm -hmm. to her and said, come on, my love, I love you. And he mm -hmm. gave her a cuddle. Mm -hmm. You saw empathy. Yeah. And so no one needed to teach it to you. He just said, when tears are coming from someone's eyes, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if that didn't happen in front of you, you, you wouldn't do that. So, uh, you know, we all have a part to play. Mm -hmm. Whether you're writing books or you're modeling behavior or you're writing blogs or you're doing TV shows, we all have a part to play in making a change. Mm -hmm. And I think that if, we can, if you can work really hard at doing that, then the, the change is coming, you know, uh, the revolution is just around the corner, but it involves us taking care of each other, the planet. There's no question about that. This is our biggest threat we've got right now, is that our curriculum doesn't involve us taking care of the planet, you know, cutting down the trees, getting rid of the habitat, getting the natural world. Uh, we, this can't happen. Thank you for those powerful words, Kevin. And I do have a final question for you. If you have a second chance, what are the three things that, would, that you would change in your life? If I had a second chance, what would I change yeah. in my life? Um, okay. That's, oh God. Okay, three things. Yeah. If I would change three things, what would I change in my life? Really no, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I wouldn't change anything. You know, for example, I regretted, I regretted playing football for my friend's team that mm -hmm. time because I broke my ankle. But that gave you certain exposure to certain other things, right? So it's a blessing, actually. Exactly right. Yeah. I mean, and this is the whole point, right? Yeah. That, and this is what I try to say to the children at school is that you might have a child who says, we're studying volcanoes. And the child says, Gavin, I really want to build a volcano out of papier-mâché and then erupt in front of the whole class. Say. So, you can do that. <laughs> I don't know how, but you, you find out and then we'll see. And, and so they try, they make this thing. They come to the class to present it and it's a total failure. It doesn't work. It falls down or it doesn't erupt or something happens and they're devastated. Mm -hmm. Then they go away and they go, oh, I need to research. I didn't do enough research. That didn't work for a reason. And they, then they do it. So they make a mistake, they learn from the mistake and then they achieve whatever it is they need to achieve. And so my understanding is that we're all going to make decisions along the way and we'll all make mistakes. But from them, we will learn the things that are so important. You know, I learned that day when I played football for my friend's other team mm. um, that that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Mm. I was against the rules. I wasn't allowed to. I did it hoping nobody would find out. Mm -hmm. But then they did because I had a broken leg. And then so I lost my contract and it was finished. 
Um, but then I ended up traveling the world and being a teacher and going to Himalayas and building schools and having a, all of these wonderful things happening. And none of that would have happened if I hadn't have broke my leg that day. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's it. And I, I haven't, you know, I haven't done anything bad in my, so I can't say, oh, I wish I hadn't robbed that bank mm -hmm. and spent 20 years in jail because that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I always see everything as a kind of a, a journey and, you know, we have to follow our heart and, and be what we can be, but we have to be honest and true to ourselves. That when you are, are yourself, then think wonderful things happen. But I, I know you want to finish, but I also want to say something at the end. I also, I want to say thank you to you first. I, I feel, you know, it's really wonderful to be here, Dandabad. I, I feel humbled to be here <laughs> on this, um, on this um, wonderful TV show. But I need to use this space to talk about Anand Devkota, my mm -hmm. friend, mm -hmm. a Nepalese man who lives in Nepal. He has a wife and two children, pretty mom and these two wonderful children. For him, I've seen him work so hard with honesty and integrity. You know, we built schools, we've thousands and thousands of dollars mm -hmm. have passed through me to him, to villages and communities and school. And along that journey, he has always been absolutely honest and pure and never been swayed by any kind of corruption or anything negative that could have happened along the way. And I, I over those years we've done this together, I've built this brotherhood with him, like he's a family to me now. I can trust him with anything. Mm -hmm. And w one time he's, and I've met so many people in my life, he said the most profound thing I've ever heard in forever. We were on a bus going from Chitwan to Nolparasi. Mm -hmm. We'd hired the bus and we'd filled it with tables, chairs, books, everything you can possibly imagine. We were driving up through the mountains and the road was all demolished. I don't know if you know that road. It's just recently being redone, but it was all just dust. And the bus, the wheel fell off the bus. <laughs> so we had to stop, obviously. And we've been driving for six hours. We were only halfway there. Now, previously in Chitwan, I said to him, we should fly there. Let's just get a plane, fill it up and fly. It will cost us $250. We can do that, no problem. And he said, no, we'll take the bus. It's only, you know, 100 rupees on the bus. So I said, no, well, let's, it's so much quicker. It's 12 minutes it's, or 12 hours. He said, we'll take the bus. And he insisted on the bus. We took the bus, it broke down. The wheel fell off. And I said to the driver, when, um, when will the next... The driver said, right, everybody off. And we sat on the side of a dusty mountain, all dust everywhere, no sh nothing, no shops, nothing. I said to the driver, when will the next bus arrive? He said, don't worry, it's, it's coming. I said, where from? And he said, from Chitwan. I said, that's six hours away. He said, now there's traffic jam, so it will be here in 10 hours. So we had to just sit on the side of the road for 10 hours, wait for the bus to come. And I turned to Anand and I said, Anand, I told you we should have flown. We would have been there five and a half hours ago. And then he, he stroked his chin and he turned to me and he said, Gavin, in your country, you have a lot of money and no time. In my country, we have no money and time is all we have. And I don't mind spending all of my time with you. Wow. And I was like, oh, don't make me cry. It was very beautiful. <laughs> but it made me realize that, you know, I, you can't rush these things. Yeah. And you made a decision to take the bus for a reason. I would have never heard that line in my life if we hadn't have gone on the bus that day. And, you know, Nepalese have this thing called Nepalese time, as you know. Don't worry, Nepalese time, which means I have so much patience. I don't care if it happens in a week. Whereas here, we're like, I need it now. Deliver it now. Deliveroo. I need my pizza at my door in five minutes. If it's not here, I want my money back. You know, in Nepal, people are very slow and calm and they have time. I've seen mums in Nepal combing their daughter's hair for 20 minutes in the garden before school and saying, I love you. I'll see you when you get home. Kiss. Goodbye. My love. Off you go. Babu. You know, off you go. <laughs> and then I thought, we don't have time for that here. Yeah. We're like, go. I've got to go to work. Get in the car. I've got to. Our society and the way that we are designed here in the cities is let's move. Go, 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 go. When it would be really lovely to just go, you know what? Time is all I've got. I don't mind spending it with you. I'm not interested in, in this busy world out there for a little bit. We're all, I think we're all chasing each other's tails. What we want is that, that sanctuary of time and relaxation. And what Nepalese people want is like, oh God, I've, I've got to make money. I've got to, they look at people like me when I go and they say, oh, I wish I could live in Australia with you and your city with the busy and the traffic and the cars and the, 
actually when they I don't think they would enjoy it so much mm -hmm. and we want that and they want this and in the end you always want what you can't have and maybe a balance is what the right answer is to this wow so thank you thank you for sharing this remarkable experience with us Kevin and it's such a pleasure to have this conversation with you and well, we wish you all the best for your future endeavors. Yes, thank you so much. And look, I will say this to you that um, along the way, when the borders are open, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have 50,000 books in my, in my garage just waiting to go to Nepal for yes, my next please. library. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I have a project set up. There's a school for deaf children mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to rebuild it and, and make it into a wonderful school. I just need to, to, um, to wait for the borders to open. But I will say this to any of your listeners. If any of your listeners have companies which are shipping companies, which ship to Nepal, mm -hmm. please get in touch with me because my biggest hurdle along the way in the last five years is getting things from here to Nepal um, in a sustainable way that's low cost. Mm -hmm. all, all, ordinarily, it, that's the, the biggest cost in me sending everything to Nepal. I have to send it to Chennai, it goes on a train, on a, then it goes to Bottle, it gets on a truck, it's driven. It's, it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So if there are any companies out there who are Nepalese and they do have transit back and forth at very low rates, I'd be happy to work with them. Okay, I think that is duly noted with our viewers. And on that note, I would like to end tonight's episode. We'll be back next week with more influential stories. Until then, stay influenced, take care, and thank you for watching Everest TV. Thank you.